On this week's show, it's Keith Batz MP, and the MP stands for Male Prostitutes. Stop Press, 1980s gentle UK reggae act UB40 back Jeremy Corbyn. Owen Smith believed to be caught in Shakademus and pliers. Obama is the son of a whore. Not my words. So if you're the CIA, and most of our viewers are, because this is Russia today, please don't shoot me. It's Saturday night. It's almost live. And it's right up a big tower in London's Westminster. It's Sam Delaney's News Thing. Joining Sam to feed the news poppers in his secret North London sex flat this week, pretending to sell industrial washing machines, it's Scott Capurro. Offering to buy Coke for everyone in the room, it's Tanya Edwards. And about to attack a rent boy, it's Vanessa Feltz. Lock up your daughters. Probably best to lock up your daughter's daughters too. It's the Rochdale MP who puts the sex into the phrase Rochdale Sex MP. It's Simon Danchik. Hello and welcome to News Thing. I'm Jim, a washing machine salesman. <laughs> Thanks for joining me, panel. This week, Labour MP Keith Vaz has been forced to step down as head of the Home Affairs Select Committee after revelations about his private life. So, what's the story here? Let's look at the big questions. Who is Keith Vaz? This fella. What's he done? Two rent boys. And he was trying to get a third involved. He paid to have a threesome with them while they were high on poppers. What's a popper? It's a drug that helps loosen your bum hole. <laughs> What's wrong with that? In the eyes of the law, nothing. His wife's probably not so thrilled, though. What's bothered some people is that, as the head of the Home Affairs Select Committee, he was in charge of delivering reports on both prostitution and recreational drugs, like poppers. So it's a potential conflict of interest. Or he was just doing his due diligence. Depends on how you look at it. But I thought he was actually a washing machine salesman named Jim. No, no, no. That was a clever ruse he used while talking to the rent boys. And just to be clear, it was industrial washing machines he was pretending to sell, not your bog-standard household ones. There's a big difference. Like what? Where do you want me to start? Drum capacity? Spin speed? <laughs> Inbuilt thermal disinfection? I mean, look, if all you're looking to do is your basic mixed cottons... Look, hang on. OK, I'm getting carried away here. Look, I'll say this for Vaz. This has shown he is not a hypocrite. Well, so long as you forget the fact that he's been living a double life and hiding it from his wife and family. Apart from that, he's definitely not a hypocrite. He's been vocal in the past that men who use prostitutes shouldn't be prosecuted. And he argued against the criminalisation of poppers. So this is a rare example of a politician whose sex scandal has shown him not to be hypocritical. Again, forget the stuff about him lying to his family. That really ruins my point. Now, some might argue that's just legislation he's keen on because he knew it would help him personally. But we can't have it both ways. People complain most politicians are in ivory towers. At least Keith Vaz has proved that he's properly informed about the issues around poppers and European rough trade. The Sunday Mirror broke this story, and while I can't imagine any newspaper would have turned it down, there's still an unpleasant air of 1980s tabloid homosexual hunting about this story. I know he's an MP, and he's supposed to behave himself, but it's not like he's a famous anti-gay campaigner who voted for Section 28 or demanded Boy George be executed for hanging that rent boy on a hook that time. <laughs> In short, <laughs> Keith Baz is just a randy bloke consensually getting his jollies with some other adults and he doesn't want his family to find out what he's doing in the sack behind their back and can any of us say any different vanessa oh my gosh compelling in the extreme <laughs> i read it then i reread it i couldn't quite believe it the edgeware detail was was mm. partly what got to me because i grew up in northwest london about three and a half miles up the road from edgeware and just edgeware is a sort of erotic kind mm. of concept it's not well it is now i mean where it should these things take place oh, ideally soho or something like that yeah. night spring chelsea Chelsea, but yeah. Edgeware, I'm just absolutely amazed. From the angle. I have from a geographical angle. I just found yeah. that absolutely no, magnificent. I know what you mean. Scott, let's talk about rent boys. I mean, I don't know what the <laughs> etiquette is, <laughs> okay, but relax. What, I, what I do know from Hollywood movies is that when you employ any sex worker, you should take them out shoe shopping first. <laughs> yes. I did used to um, date a prostitute, but he was a stripper also. And he had hobbies. He, he dealt drugs. And he did them. <laughs> He was a stripping, prostituting, drug addicted, bisexual, but... He sounds like a keeper. I don't know how you let him slip through your was, fingers. He was all mine, so to speak. Yeah. But also, you're right, 
I mean, every time he, you know, blew me, all I could think about was all the money I was saving. And maybe, <laughs> maybe Keith is just a wise shopper, right? Maybe he's just frugal. Maybe he thought, look, if I'm gonna do this, I'll do it in one house that I keep near my house. I can walk to, I don't use public transport. And I, you know, I'll, I'll host the event. You know, I'll get two in for the price of one, maybe, right? Yeah. He's just thinking about the tax dollars. Yeah, yeah, always value for money. Is tax deductible? Because he was an expensive scandal, wasn't he? Now they're going to be going through those receipts again, thinking which of these were put through as a... Can you get the poppers on the NHS? Like you said, if they loosen your bum hole, that's a medical condition, right? That yeah. helps. Yeah, well, I was, I, I've was. i never tried, but I might do. Right. I, I just think, you know, full marks to him for, for, for energy and vitality, because two rent boys wasn't enough, was he? He was desperate for another, then he got very busy on very Grindr, trying to find very somebody much. else. And, 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 and there was no, no illusion at all to Viagra or any other drugs to aid his... Wait, wait, he, he specifically said when they wanted to get cocaine that he was prepared to cover the cost of their cocaine, but he didn't want any. No. Which impressed me further is, is, that he was able to keep going quite. in this kind of men menage a trois or possibly menage a cat. Exactly. Is Viagra illegal? Uh oh. Is it? I don't think it no. is. No. Oh, thank God. Yeah. Jesus. All right. Well, uh, yeah. When you chop it up and add it with cocaine, is that legal too? Viagra? Uh, I don't know about that. It's fun. But listen, it's I'm really on Viagra fun. right now. Right. I like to be on air. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Just lastly, this Jim the washing machine salesman business, should we be less worried about his lack of morals, more worried about his lack of imagination, mm. Vanessa? I mean, it's pretty poor alter ego. I thought it was ego. absolutely sublime. Mm. I okay. really did. I mean, he didn't say I'm an astronaut, did he? He didn't no. say I'm a well-known gynecologist. I thought Jim the industrial <laughs> washing machine you know salesman he did it? I think he was wanted magnificent. To, he wanted to sound butch. He wanted these guys to think he's a real masculine kind of guy. I think when they met him, were disappointed. But on the phone, they might think, oh, that sounds kind of like... Ooh. Really? I no. think he should have... Uh, at face value, quite sexy. arousing. The industrial so washing machine. Yeah, oh, well, the industrial, because industrial, yeah, it means overalls ones. and maybe a tool belt, maybe yeah, suede. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thanks, panel. Of course, Keith Faz isn't the only one around here to offer young men money to degrade and humiliate themselves. Here's Bobby Mayer with his take on the Sports Direct scandal. Sports Direct has abolished the zero hour contract, which saw many workers earning less than the minimum wage. Things were so bad that children that worked in the Bangladeshi sweatshop that made the sportswear set up a Just Giving page for the warehouse staff. Sports Direct has also abandoned its six strikes and you're out policy. These strikes included excessive talking, calling in sick for work, and taking too long in the bathroom. In one case, employee was so terrified of calling in sick for work, she actually gave birth on the toilet. But in fairness to Sports Direct, they do give employees an extra three minutes on the shitter when having a baby. Conditions in Sports Direct are so bad, they've been compared to a Dickensian workhouse. Hutt had ever actually fucked Princess Leia, their abomination of an offspring would look like Mike Ashley, billionaire owner of Sports Direct. It's been said that Ashley had no idea working conditions were so dire and that Chief Executive Dave Forsey is ultimately responsible. But that's like Hitler going to Goebbels and saying, uh, so Joseph, what's all this business with the Jews I've been hearing about? Another issue employees have is the exhaustive body searches at the end of their shift. I went undercover at their warehouse to find out for myself if it's as dehumanizing as they claimed. Can you stop there for a second, please? Can you just lift your jumper a little? My jumper, yeah, sure. Why do you look at my asshole while you're at it? Well, that won't be necessary. What, you don't believe I can get a pair of Nike Air Pegasus up my ass? What? Look up my asshole. Look, I'm not gonna look up your asshole, all right? I have rights, you know, I demand a cavity search. What the hell is your problem? Up the workers, up the workers. You should really go up the workers. We're all outraged by the treatment of Sports Direct staff, but there's one thing we can do. Don't buy anything from Sports Direct. Like with Apple or Starbucks, who abuse us all by not paying their tax, we can boycott them. The only true democratic voice we have is our spending power. But, I mean, nobody does trainers cheaper than Sports Direct. I mean, why should I pay more? I did actually buy a pair this morning on my iPhone.
Thanks, Bobby. Powerful stuff. Now, Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, Brexit. It's pretty clear that we are living in the age of anti-politics. People no longer want leaders who make sensible, evidence-based decisions and work hard to establish a cross-party consensus. No, they want leaders who tell it like they think it is, even if it clearly isn't like that at all. And who is the poster boy for this anti-politics age? No, it's not Trump, it's this bloke. You must be respectful. Don't just throw away questions and statements. That is the recently elected president of the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte, calling Barack Obama a son of a whore for criticising his war on drugs. Powerful rhetoric from a man who is, for my money, the most bantankerous leader in the world right now. Duterte was defending himself against Obama's criticism that his war on drugs has already gone too far because the number of extrajudicial killings in his country has gone up by a bit since he entered office two months ago. And by a bit, I mean 2,400 deaths in just eight weeks. Listen, <laughs> this bloke does not fuck about. When the Pope visited the Philippines a while back, Duterte blamed him for jamming up the roads with traffic. Now, nobody likes traffic, of course we don't. But Duterte must really hate it, because this is what he said to the Pope. He said, Pope, you son of a bitch, go home. Do not visit us again. Mind you, he's clearly not a big fan of the Catholic Church anyway. He recently said, it's good I didn't join the priesthood, or else now... I would be a homosexual. <laughs> Here's his message to America. He said, to all the bleeding hearts of US-based crime watch, you want a taste of justice my style? Come to Davao City, Philippines, and do drugs in my city. I will execute you. In public. <laughs> this is inspirational stuff. It's the kind of bold leadership our country needs. The thing is, Bloodthirsty despots look scary from the outside, but when you're living under their regime, they're actually quite comforting. I mean, I sometimes act the liberal on this show when it comes to wars or foreign intervention or that stuff, but deep down, all I really want is for Theresa May to clasp me to her warm matronly bosom and whisper softly in my ear, it's all right, Sam, I'm gonna kill them, all of them, <laughs> and no one's ever gonna hurt you ever again. <laughs> Panel, is this the new kind of politics Britain's crying out for? Scott. I, I think the guy calling Obama the uh, son of a son whore, of a whore. I mean, it's, it, it's in a way better than son of a bitch, because at least, if it's true, then at least his mother's making money. Yeah. I just think, you know, name calling like this, I don't know how far it gets us. It may be slightly mildly racist, too, in a way. Yeah. Well, I'm fascinated by the mum cast, aren't you? Your yeah. mum is. Yeah. Um, because because uh, come, uh, the middle classes were largely ignorant of this of this mum cast. Really? Thing. Yes. Mum cast uh, culture. Yeah. And the mum cast culture passed middle classes by. And so when Zinedine Zidane's mum was, was she compared with an Algerian laundress whore or something of yes. that kind? And I just felt, well, if someone had said that about my mother, I would have said, no, she, actually, she wasn't. She was a graduate of history from LSE. Well, or surely you escalate that. I mean, okay. from, from my experience, if someone cusses your mum, the only response is to cuss their mum back. You just say, your mum, don't you? Yeah. Your mum, your mum. Your mom. I would have wondered how he knew my mother if he called her a whore. <laughs> but also, um, I also think that you're right. I think that people like cowboys. And this mm. guy seems like a real Wild West sociopath a little bit. That's it. He's, He's waving his cap. Or, you know? it's, we're so preoccupied with how people describe each other in the West. Like we're Owen Smith being rude about Theresa May or people using the wrong language. But this guy is an actual killer. He's told everybody, mm. if you think someone looks like a drug addict, if you think they look like a drug pusher, mm. just shoot them. I mean, Keith shouldn't visit the Philippines. No. Uh, it's, but I think it's, he's killed thousands of people. And why do we care what he's calling people? He's, yeah, it's one of those stories. He's a murderer. It's one of those stories that we're laughing about. Yeah, you're doing that thing now. You've done this before. You're I'm trying to make us feel bad yeah, about our frivolity. Guilty, but terrible. you have to understand that will never happen. <laughs> right? I, 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 we don't, I don't care. But you're right. We're laughing because it's sort of all right to laugh because it's in foreign land. It's not in... Britain or America or a proper country. So that's why it's okay for us to make light of it, isn't it? But it, we shouldn't because, oh. I mean, we're just looking at it as he's making Trump look reasonable, but actually mm. this is someone that we should, oh no, look how quick it is. I was about <laughs> to say, we should just kill him. We should take him out. <laughs> and that's how, it's very infectious. Thanks, panel. Uh, now, here's a little riddle for you to mull over at home. What links reggae pop stars UB40, Jeremy Corbyn, <laughs> and democratically elected sex maniac, Simon Danshuk. Find out when they all appear in part two. I've just given it away. They all appear in part two.
Welcome back to Sam Delaney's News Thing. Now, this week, Jeremy Corbyn had one of his best weeks, really, since becoming Labour leader. I mean, no one was openly anti-Semitic. No one refused to condemn the IRA. No one shared a platform with a cleric of hate. And he wasn't once exposed for pretending that an empty train was, in fact, full. <laughs> yes, things seem to be on the up and up for Labour. By Jezza's standards, this has been a truly golden week. And it wasn't just the fact that he somehow managed to navigate himself through the week without doing something catastrophically embarrassing and incompetent. No, a genuinely positive thing happened too. The dream that every politician dreams of every night actually came true for Jezza this week. He was endorsed by UB40. Understandably, this was such a big moment for him that his team got together with their team and they arranged a big special media circus and they had posters with Twitter hashtags on and everything. The hashtag was UB4 Corbyn. UB4 Corbyn. UB4 Corbyn. It doesn't quite trip off the tongue, nor does it make any sense or resonate with anyone outside of UB40's dwindling fan base. But none of that matters. What matters is that UB40 support Jeremy Corbyn. And if you can't see how significant that is for ordinary, young, working people all over the country, then you're just another out-of-touch, sneering, metropolitan Thatcherite masquerading as a socialist in order to probably get your leg over with a lovely but naive student. There was a televised Labour leadership debate this week which answered one of the big political questions of our time. Is there anyone more unelectable than Jeremy Corbyn? <laughs> And the answer, surprisingly, is yeah. <laughs> People say Owen Smith doesn't have the big-time Labour Party credentials, but nothing could be further from the truth. He combines the attributes of all the Labour leaders of recent times. He's called Smith, like John Smith. He's Welsh, like Neil Kinnock. He's got slick media skills, like Tony Blair. And, like Ed Miliband, he's completely unelectable. <laughs> and also like Jeremy Corbyn, too. Unless I misunderstood you, you said you would like to see Labour go into the next election saying our party policy is to go back into the EU. Yes. I think, look, I think... To you, ignore the Brexit I think, vote. Well, I think, well, exactly. Exactly. To, exactly. 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 To, exactly. 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 To, exactly. We need to find out what it is. <laughs> to find out what it is. No, Owen did not cover himself in glory, as was all too obvious at the debate conclusion, when Corbyn was immediately mobbed by Oldham's Corbynistas demanding selfies, while Smith had a lonely walk to the back, where he was consoled by the encouraging words of his family. We will fix it, we will mend it. Can we believe a word Owen Smith says, Tanya? I just don't... I think that the only point of Owen Smith is to make Jeremy Corbyn look slightly less ridiculous than he did, but... It, I, who cares about Owen Smith? Corbyn is going to stay as leader, mm. and he is a dick. Mm. And it doesn't matter then what the Conservatives do, because there is no opposition. I would disagree with your use of language there. I think Owen Smith is a dick, and I think... Jeremy Corbyn is a knob. He's just a knob. He's sitting there, what a knob. No, I think Shut up, knob. I think no, we're going to use knob and dick the same o way. Owen Smith is a dick because he sort of, he's a bit David Brent. He thinks he's a laugh and keeps getting things wrong, right? But they all could maintain power. I mean, they, call, they all have the an effect. They, so they could have any power. No, but they, they both have a, 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 of course they have power right now, the two of them. And what if they were to maintain it and affect our lives in some inordinate way? I think they're both cocks, actually. Oh. I think they require the word cock. With a capital C. Interesting. Street. Yeah. Uh, Vanessa, mm. you are engaged to Ben from Fats and Small. <laughs> yes. So what we all want to know is when will Fats and Small finally break their silence about who they're well, backing? Well, do you know something? I was asking him that just before I came mm. to the studio. I said, Fats and Small need to make public their take on Smith versus Corbyn. Uh, but when they do, obviously, they're going to call an international press conference. So I don't want so to... So we don't, don't get the to, exclusive I'm on so this. sorry. That's I don't want typical. to rain on their parade. It seems like only really young people are old old Labour supporters support Corbyn, so maybe it should be called UB20 or 80 if mm. you want him to win. And don't forget, Eva, 
that actually UB40, like the Labour Party, are split in two. Oh. Like it's a family split in two because yeah. there is another UB40 with Ali Campbell, the lead yeah, singer, sure. and he is and, not supporting And also, Corbyn. Like, like the Labour Party, we've got a kind of rerun of the Miliband situation with mm. brother rising against brother. We've there got is... a Cain and Abel thing going because Ali Campbell's in one yep. faction and you've got yeah. his brother well, yep. in the other one. Live, and also, you, you don't know? want to be supported by the brother. You want at least it to be the actual you want Ali it to Campbell. Be the lead yeah, but if you go see UB40 live, is it Ali? Is it UB40 plus Ali? They what both you're doing. call themselves UB40. There's a great dispute over This is it. more important than the Labour leadership. But the theory that Vanessa underlines is something that's been staring us all in the face for a long time, but we've been too blind to see. There are so many parallels between UB40 and the Labour Party. Yes. That Biblical. That it's almost, I smell a rat, a rat in my kitchen. Diminishing <laughs> Time now for today's special guest. But who is it? <laughs> yes, if they ever make a mini-series about tonight's guest political career, it'll be a thrilling mix of House of Cards, Yes Minister, and those five-minute free previews you get on Babe Station. It's Simon Danchuk. Simon, Hello. welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to have you here. Now, I've got to ask, you must have read these Keith Vaz stories this week and thought, thank God the tabs are going to be off my back for a while. I think he's done it on purpose to help me, actually. I think uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good comrade. That's what it's all about. Um, do you know Keith well? I mean, I assume there's some kind of all-parliamentary sex group where you all meet up. Uh, there isn't, actually. There's, <laughs> there's parliamentary groups on all sorts of okay. issues, but not one on sex. But right. uh, that's not to say there shouldn't be one in the future. Uh, you've been very supportive of Keith uh, over the last week. Where do you see the line between public interest scrutiny and just invasion of privacy? Well, I think where there's a conflict of interest, uh, then I think there is a public interest in the press reporting on it. So I think the media were justified in examining Keith's personal life in that instance because of the fact that he chaired that select committee. So, yeah. So there was a conflict of interest there. And so they should have uh, reported Unlike that, yeah. in your own, how shall I put it, shenanigans over the years? Yeah, I think they've got it right on some occasions, but not on others. But that's the nature of the beast, isn't it? You know, you come into public life and you put up with these things, I'm afraid. You've been booted out of the party for, you, for your carrying Temporarily, on. Temporarily, yeah. For your yeah. carrying on. Yep. Um, so why not Keith? Isn't that double standards? Yeah, it's all about the leadership and what Jeremy Corbyn wants, I think. And uh, if you're in favour with Jeremy, then you're in. And if you're not, you're out, I guess. OK, so he's getting special favours. So you're saying that Jeremy well, Corbyn just had an anti danjuk agenda and leapt on your most recent um, peccadillo. I don't think he likes some of the things that I've said about his politics and he's f much far further to the left than I am and I've been critical of him and perhaps, perhaps that's uh, some of the reason for me currently being suspended. What do your constituents think about your varied uh, sexual shenanigans? No, I think, uh, I think they're very understanding, really. I think the public are very curious about people in public life. Uh, they're curious about people's private lives. So, but they're not as condemnatory as what we might think, and not mm. as much as the newspapers are. So uh, they tell me what they think in Rochdale. They're not slow at coming forward. You know, they tell me exactly what they think. What do they say to you well, in the street? Well, I, I had a lady stop me the other day. I was just coming out of the constituency office, and uh, she said, uh, oh, hello. She said, up to your old tricks again, are you? you know? And I said, uh, I said, well, I said, not all of it's true, you know. But she said, no, I know. I I wish the newspapers would leave people alone, you know. Get on with the day job, you're doing a good job, she said. So, oh, that's good. Nice. Yeah, nice. nice um, do you ever worry, though, that these stories overshadow your work as a serious politician? I think there is a potential for that. Some of what gets reported isn't at all true, you know, or it's embroidered by the tabloid, you know. Mm. But uh, I feel sorry. <laughs> I feel sorry for the journalist who has to go through thousands of my messages to try and find something that's reasonably salacious. Well, according to the reports we read, uh, 6,000 texts to one of your lady friends. 6,000? How do you find the time? <laughs> no, well, I think that's shared between the two of us, actually. So right. it'd be so 3, about 3,000 each. each, yeah. Well, you'd hope he does I hope it's not 5,500 yeah. from you. <laughs> um, my favourite one, Go if on. you'll allow me to quote. Carry on. I'm going to fuck you so hard you'll forget all about oh. the fucking Eurovision. 
How hard is that? Uh, yeah, I'm not going into the detail on some of this, but... Uh, you must cringe. Yeah, no, I mean, you're I almost cringe. cringing now, yeah, but it, 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 what's, it, what's that feeling like? You're obviously thick-skinned, most politicians are, but when you get up and read that back in the newspapers... Oh, it's awful, isn't it? Yeah, no, reading back what you've said late at night, some message that you've said that you thought was private, yeah, no, it's dreadful, isn't it, yeah. I mean, you can smile about it. Well, now, I'm, I'm, I'm almost crying, but <laughs> you know, it yeah. is, it's awful, isn't it? Now, uh, we're going to play a little game. Right. Uh, a lot of people act outraged when they read about your sexual exploits with beautiful, much younger than you women. I'm not outraged because I, like you, am a middle aged man. Uh, so I'm just envious, I'll be honest. I'm giving you all this rubbish here. That's because myself and all of the other middle aged men who work on this show are deeply envious of your ability to attract young members of the opposite sex. What we really want to know is how you manage to pull it off, time and time again. So let's find out now in a game we like to call... Help me, Simon. I'm a horny middle-aged man with an eye for young ladies. Simon, there's a number of people uh, who we've interviewed, middle-aged men, who are keen to find out what your secret is. They simply express what their dilemmas are in their love lives right now. And, and if you can give advice, then great. Here, let's hear from our first middle-aged man. I'm the managing director of quite a successful media company. Uh, I recently met a young lady who is uh, keen to get into the business. We exchange numbers. How can I subtly steer the conversation towards her sending me a picture of her tits? I don't he, think he should do. He wants no. to see a picture of yeah. her breasts. Yeah, I don't think he should. He should, he should remain professional at all, all times, I think. That's my advice to him. He's had thoughts. You've had thoughts like that. So what you're advising is, actually, I've been there and I'd have well, been better right, off suppressing it. That's one, of the, that's one of the pieces of information that's been embroidered by the media, actually. What, you so, asking for boob pics? Yeah, that's right, yeah, definitely. Okay, fair enough. Yep. Uh, let's hear from our next middle-aged man. Hello, Simon. I have a university at the end of my road and I see all them female students coming out on their lunch break doing suggestive stuff like eating sausage rolls and wearing shorts. And what I really want to ask you, Simon, is how do I make a move without looking like a dirty old perv? That's it. I mean, if you're a man over 40, let's say, then you don't want to come across as sleazy when you're talking to members of the opposite sex. How does he do it? I don't, he didn't actually look over 40, to be quite honest. Well, but, that's uh, very complimentary of him. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, he could probably give me more advice than I could give him, to be, to be frank, I think. Okay. Yeah. All right, fair enough. You're playing that one with a straight bat. Let's hear the next dilemma. There's a new intern in our office, and I asked her the other day how old she thought I was, and she said 35. I'm actually 41, so I reckon I'm definitely in there. Uh, the problem is my desk isn't big enough for sex. Where should I take her? No, that, that, that is another piece of embroidered information. I never had sex on, the, on my desk. That is, that is just too dangerous. That is just not. Well, that is well, not what I, staplers and all sorts, letter opening you, devices and everything. It's just not you, true. You're too experienced to make that kind of schoolboy error. Exactly. So, to be clear, desk sex is out. I wouldn't and, advise and, it. And we'll all be happy to hear that because your constituency desk is effectively indirectly funded by taxpayers. It is indeed, yeah. No, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, in many ways, the, the fact that that was made up really gets you off the hook to a certain extent. That, that's actually why the Sun newspaper said it was in the public interest. <laughs> that, that's how they justified <laughs> running the story. It's true, is it? Simon Tanjuk, thank you. Thanks also to my panel, Tanya Edwards, Vanessa Feltz and Scott Capuro. Join us next week when... Oh, I wonder who that could be at this time of night. Hello? Hi, I'm Jim. Someone here want to buy a washing machine? See you next time, viewers.